Well, we've been talking about faith, hope, and love, and uh, 1 Corinthians First Corinthians thirteen thirteen says, "Now these three abide: faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love." But because of all your questions last week, I didn't get to finish this. So we're going to finish it this week. I read them in your mind, and we had to take time and handle them in the in the Holy Spirit. So uh, we covered faith and hope last week a little bit, and today we're going to look at love. Paul says of love that it's the greatest of these. He says these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. If you remember, we used the illustration of a rocket ship, that there's so much apparatus and construction in a rocket ship that is designed to provide liftoff, but it's never going to orbit with the ship. It's only a very small uh, capsule a very small part of the rocket going up. Everything else is falling off. The the uh, launch pad is falling off. The fuel is getting burned. The fuel tanks are falling off. Much of the rocket is important because you can't get there without it, but it's not going with the rocket. That's how much of our life is. There are many things that God wants us to do. They're part of life. They're necessary things in life. But we also have to stay focused to set our mind on things that are above, not on earthly things, because uh, there are only three things going with us. That are the, those are the things done in faith, done in hope, and done in love. So today we're looking at love, which is the greatest of, of uh, these things. And as we begin, I want to tell you a story. There was a man named George Crane, who I didn't know his uh, name, but he's a well-known uh, psychiatrist, physician, and minister. He died in 1995, but he was also known as a conserv conservative syndicated columnist. That's a talented guy, isn't it, to be a psychologist, physician, a minister, and a syndicated columnist, okay? But he tells the story of a woman that came into his office, and she was full of hatred towards her husband. She said... I don't only want to get rid of the man, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to make him hurt even more than he made me hurt. So Dr. Crane smiled with a sinister smile, and he suggested an ingenious plan. He said, ma'am, if you just go home and act as if you really, really love your husband, and tell him how much he means to you, praise him for every little decent trait that he has, go out of your way, be kind, be considerate, be generous as possible, spare no effort, ma'am to please him, to enjoy him, and make him believe that you mean it. After you've convinced him of your undying love and that you can't live without him, that's when you got to drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce and that you're going to leave him. Oh, the doctor said, that'll hurt him. That'll really hurt him. What revenge you'll get on your husband. The woman's eyes filled with the glee of revenge, and she smiled as she left his office, thinking, what a beautiful, beautiful plan. Boy, will I ever stick it to this guy. And she did so just as planned with enthusiasm for several months, acting as if she loved everything about her husband. She was kind. She was sweet. She was listening. She was giving. She reinforced him. She shared with him. And after a few months of not hearing from the lady, Dr. Crane called for a follow-up. He said, ma'am, have you dropped the bomb? Have you divorced your husband yet? And to which she said, doctor, why would I divorce him? I love the man. She said, I never realized how much I loved him before. I would never divorce the greatest man in the world. You see, her feelings changed as her emotion changed. Motion creates emotion is the moral of the story. And that, that's a, a story from the practice of George Crane, a well-known, uh, I guess, psychologist and physician and minister. So uh, it works. How many of you know that it works? Amen. If you don't know that it works, you should, you should say that you know that it works so that I'll think that you know that it works and we'll all be convinced. Because you see, it'll work. Your actions, love is, love is a verb. Amen. Love is not not just what you say, love is what you do. And so often, you know, as we talk about agape love, unconditional love, we just can't really wrap our minds around that. And as we, as we talk about that, think about how God has loved us when we were unlovable. And He still does. You know, God's the only person that truly knows all your trash, and yet He would still die for you. Amen? 
That's agape love. But that same love is to be present in, in our lives. These three remain. These are the things that God wants us to be doing now and in, in eternity. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love stands head and shoulders above everything else. Love is the greatest thing. Now, love is the greatest among the gifts. It's the greatest among the virtues. And uh, love is also the greatest among the commandments. All the language of the New Testament, and even the old, but especially the new, tells us that love is the greatest. In the last chapter, if we were to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you would see Paul talking about all the gifts. Uh, prophecy, healing, discerning of spirits, you know, faith. Faith, the gift of faith, so many wonderful gifts that the Holy Spirit drops into our life. But yet, in the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says that there's an even more excellent way than this. He's talking about love. Love is the greatest among the gifts. So, you know, if you, if you can't speak real good, if you can't, you know, if you don't have great gifts of faith or great gifts of healing or whatever, if you can just love, just love. And that's the greatest thing. Uh, that's the greatest thing that we can do. You see, sometimes we, <laughs> it, it always perplexes me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the skin like the rest of you. So I, I'm not acting as if I don't struggle to love people at times. But it always perplexes me how Christians are just waiting for, you know, the secrets to come out to get the person to, you know, oh, we're going to reveal, you know, all of their, their sin. Come on, people. That is, that is such garbage. That is such trash. You know, if God wanted to reveal your secrets, if he really wanted to, to treat you that way, not a one of you would be able to show your, show your face in this place today. Right. Not a one of you. God makes every effort to conceal, to deal with things in love. And as we exercise the gifts, you know, I, I see this as I travel. You know, I, God has blessed me with a lot of wonderful travel companions. But I have to say that there are some that they really are very gifted, but I, I'm not going to judge them in their love. But I'm just going to say I, I, I don't see the manifestation of their love even though they're gifted you see it at times in, in people but we need to manifest love love is the greatest among the gifts if you you know if you can't speak in tongues if you can't exercise faith if you can't you know heal the sick you can do all those things by the way under the unction of the holy spirit but if you feel that you can't do any of those things one thing you can do is you you can love Amen? Love is the greatest gift. I Actually, I'm stealing from Pastor Mary. See, we're stealing back and forth this morning. That uh, ministry is a, is a glass of cold water. I love that quote. Ministry is a glass of cold water. And it's, you know, you may not be able to do a lot, but you just do what you can do. It's the greatest among the gifts. Love is the greatest among the gifts. Okay, do we believe in the reality of hell for the unrepentant sinner? Yes, absolutely. But Jesus didn't come to send people to hell. He came to deliver people from hell. Amen? Do we believe that God is a just judge? Amen. God is a just judge. But the name that God chooses to reveal himself by most in Scripture is love and mercy. It's a personal name of God, by the way. Not just an attribute. God's justice is an attribute of who he is, and it's very important. But love is God's personal name. Love is the greatest. Love is the most important. It's the most important among the gifts. Now, sometimes we just feel like we don't have anything to give or we don't have enough. And I know that... I, that, that I feel like that a lot. I, I've been doing some lift again lately. Uh, driving, you know, lift. Doing lift. Some people don't know what that is. Like Uber. Uber and lift. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to write this book someday. Someday. Giving God a lift. Because it's just amazing. It, there's just... Every day there's some story that you bring out of that. And I picked up the other day this lady that... It was given a sorrow story, and it may have been true or may have been false. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if her tears were true or false, but I can tell you that what was true is I had a dollar in my pocket, and that's the truth of all that I had. I mean, I'm not going to give her, like, my bank number or something, you know, but I mean, in my pocket, I had a dollar. And, you know, I felt kind of, I did feel bad for the lady, and, and I was giving her a ride to the bus station. Someone had purchased her the lift to the bus station she said and and I offered you could use my phone to call if you need to call someone you're welcome to do that but 
I got a dollar, and the bus station is the main hub uh, in the in the North Dayton area. It's right by Speedway. I said, I got a dollar. I'll give you a dollar so you can go get a Polar Pop while you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. And I feel kind of, in some ways, you feel kind of bad about that. Like, man, I would like to really help this lady. But even, you know, the thing is, that Polar Pop is what I had to give her. So that Polar, it's not a Polar Pop technique. For those technical people, it's a Speedway What's the Speedway one? <laughs> Icy or Freezy or whatever it is at Speedway. Not the Polar Bob. It's polar Bob's a secret. See, someone will listen. Pastor's making that story up. Circle, Circle K sells Polar Bob. Listen, people. I know nobody here would do that, but if you're going to be that detailed, we're in trouble. Because, you know, uh, I tell them when I go overseas, I can barely speak English. Don't expect me to be able to speak Tamil very well. You know, or Spanish or something. But, uh, you know, you... Ministry is a cup of cold water, you know, and when you read the story in, in Acts of how uh, Peter spoke to the crippled man and the way, and he healed the man, there's a couple of way, different ways you can read that. One way is that silver and gold I do not have for you, but such as I have I give to you, meaning that he did have money, but he discerned that money's not what the man needed. What the man needed was a miracle from God. And, God, and he gave him the miracle from God because he was anointed uh, to do that. But another way that you can read that is, I don't have any money, but I'll pray for you. And, you know, you, you can argue this up and down depending on whether you have more of a mainline slant or a faith slant on things, how you want to look at that. But at the end of the day, love was an action. Love was that what Peter had for the man, Peter gave to the man. And in that context, it was prayer, and it changed the man's whole life. Amen? Amen. Love is the greatest among the gifts. It's the greatest among the virtues. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest among the commandments. You see, we are to do our best to keep the commandments, we're not under law, we're under grace, but being under grace doesn't mean that we try to, that we just disregard, you know, what God said, obviously. If we love him, we'll keep his commandments. We might come back around to that later. We're going to break some of them. We're not going to keep them all. We're going to mess up. But I'll tell you, uh, there's something in the effort that reveals our spirit, that re reveals our, our heart. And uh, when we come back to that, assuming we get there, we'll see that he gave us the helper. He gave us the Holy Spirit to help us in that. It's not like God just said, go do something. He gave us the Holy Spirit uh, who helps us as we love him. But love is the greatest among the commandments. The greatest commandment is not do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not, uh, I should be able to name all 10 of them. I get a little nervous up here talking. You know, <laughs> do not have any gods, false gods before me. Uh, you know, th those are important commandments. But if you want to know what the greatest commandment is, why don't we just see what Jesus said? I think most of you can quote it. Jesus, what is the greatest command? Because we want to catch you, man. Because we want to, we want to prove that you're not all that you say that you are, man. Jesus says, sure, here's the greatest commandment. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang upon this. Jesus tells us that love is the greatest commandment. Judgment, you know, is not the greatest commandment. Love is the greatest commandment. Love must be involved. Love is the greatest. It's the greatest among the gifts, the greatest among Christian virtues, the greatest among the commandments. And I have been pinned many times as a love preacher, and I will gladly take it because you know what? Love is the greatest theme in all of Scripture. Love is the greatest among all of the virtues, all of the gifts, all of the commandments as I've already pointed out. And even the Apostle John, you know what he was known as? the apostle of love. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, that has like some swag to it. You're the apostle of love, you know. That's John. He was the apostle that loved Jesus. That's, now, you know, John the Revelator is the guy that wrote the book of Revelations. You want some, uh, you know, you want some, you want some judgment. You'll find some judgment for those that re reject Christ. But John was the apostle of love. That stuff wasn't revealed to him because God's just waiting to, you know, dip people in some fire. 
That was revealed to John for our sake so that we could be saved from that. So that we could recognize that God is a God of love that loved us so much that He would die for us to deliver us from that judgment. God doesn't send anyone to hell. People send themselves when they reject Him. Listen to the language that the Bible uses to describe love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, we're told that it's the greatest. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, we're told it's the most excellent way. Colossians 3, 14, we're told that love is above all. And in 1 uh, Timothy 1, 5, we're told that love is the aim. That's what we're after. You could also uh, render that verse that love is the end of the commandments. When it's all said and done, it comes down to love. So all throughout Scripture, we're told about the greatness of love. Why is love so important? We're only going to three quick aspects on why love is important. First of all, love holds it all together. Colossians 3.14 says, Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Without, now I just want you to... If, Stop there and think about that verse. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. In other words, everything could be done even perfectly, but if it's not done in love, it's not perfect. It's imperfect. It's flawed. Love is the bond of perfection. Uh, I like to say that love is the belt that holds your britches up. That's what holds it together. Love is what uh, love is what holds things together. It makes things work. Love is also uh, number two. Love is what makes things work. It says in uh, Galatians five six that faith works by love or faith works through love. Love makes things work. Um, love is the most perfect personification of God shining through us. So. What I'm saying there, love is the most perfect personification of God shining through us. What I'm saying there is that we never look more like Jesus than when we're in love, than when we're loving people. Loving people like Je Jesus did. You see, sometimes we get stuck on it. Well, what if they take advantage of me? Well, did they take advantage of Jesus? What if they're not what they're cracked up to be? Well, have you been what you're all cracked up to be? You know, I know that I haven't. And I'm sure that, pretty sure that you haven't either because last time I read it, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all, 100%. You know, we don't, we're not like Jesus because you say sometimes you want to be like Jesus because man, I could read their mind. I could tell you all about them. No, be like Jesus in loving people. Even if they take advantage of you, even if they don't appreciate it, Jesus died for everybody, even those that will reject his gift. He still died for them. Uh, which, by the way, is the only... Well, I'm not going to go down that route. I'm not going to go down that route. You're saying, why, Pastor? Because you're going to get me going again on, on Calvinism and Arminianism, and I'm not going to do it. So now you're saying, Shh, don't go there, Pastor. Don't go down that route again, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Don't go down that road, Pastor. Okay. See, I'm reading your minds. I'm reading your minds. Okay. Um, John 13, 35 says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How will, they know, how will people know that we're his disciples? By our love for one another. That, that's the number one thing that Jesus said uh, is going to show people. So, when we love people, Christ is personified through us. He's shining through us. Jesus shines through us when we love people. Okay, uh, a couple more things. I want to look at love being our purest motivation and love being our most powerful manifestation. If you want to turn there, go to 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. It says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised. Now, where I want to hone in mostly on that verse uh, is where it says that the love of God controls us or compels us. The Good News translation says we are ruled by the love of Christ. The NIV says that we're compelled by the love of Christ. King James says we're constraineth by the love of Christ. The Amplified says we are urged and impelled by the love of Christ. It's the imagery of being walled in. 
and you're going this way because you're arrested, you're walled in. It's the imagery of, in the original language, of walking on a road that is between, that is in the valley, between steep canyons. If you have a, th picture a large rock wall on this side, and a large rock wall on this side, and there's just a narrow road that goes between them, and you don't have anywhere else to go. <laughs> there's nowhere to go but down the road. There's nowhere to go but on the path. That's what he's, Paul is talking about here. He's saying, I'm constrained by the love of God. There are many things that make me feel uncomfortable, but nonetheless, I'm constrained by the love of God to love people just as they are. Uh-oh, watch it now. We might, we might be teaching the Word of God here today. I'm constrained to accept people. You know, we used to say, we catch them, he cleans them, right? It's not our job to clean people. It's our job to love people. The Word of God will work. Those that are hungry for God will discover deeper things in God as they search and as they seek. You know, uh, but the love of God constrains us. It sets us on a path that oftentimes is ridiculed by other people, oftentimes ridiculed by people within the church. Now, uh, uh, this requires maturity, and I know it's an uncomfortable illustration, but we're going to go with it. Uh, there's a great story that I just heard in a book I listened to this week of uh, around the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s in Europe, specifically in Ireland, but in kind of throughout Northern Europe, the water was really difficult and filthy. Many people were getting sick and they were dying because of the water. They were just beginning to discover the whole thing of you don't bathe in the same water that you drink. You know, we take all that for granted now, but a lot of places in the world, they don't know that still. And uh, especially, you know, 150 years ago, or however, about 140, 50 years ago, they didn't know that. They, it's just water, you drink it. But it was making people sick. And so, People throughout the centuries had realized that there is a solution to this, and that solution is to drink alcohol. <laughs> I'm being completely serious. Uh, and actually, uh, I don't drink, but if I was in a place where there was no healthy water and it was my only option, I would drink I would drink alcohol to stay alive, and so would you. David ate the showbread. Now, I'm not going deep into that story, but the showbread was not lawful for the priest to eat, but when David was hungry and there was nothing else to eat, what did David eat? The showbread. And God commended him for it, not ridiculed him for it. You know, uh, Paul said that I am all. He, Paul said that he attempts to be all things to all people at all times. But he also says that there were those who snuck in and privately uh, spied upon the liberty that we have in Christ. Now, I'm going to scare you for just a minute here. I'm, I'm going to come back to the alcohol story in a minute, but I'm going to scare you for just a minute. Uh, you know what Paul was talking about? He was talking about public bathhouse. We talk about circumcision and uncircumcision. Now, this is, please be mature when I explain this. Circumcision and uncircumcision. Now, we just throw those around like Christian terms, but they mean something. I think most people, most people in here know what circumcision and uncircumcision means. How would they even know about Timothy? How would they know? Because they would take bath in the river, they would take bath in the bathhouse, and people, they didn't sexualize the body. Like, I mean, Certain cultures did, but in America we've so sexualized the body that everything's sex. I'm seriously, but a lot of places, even to this day, the body's not sexualized about that. They they don't they don't think about it, you know, and that's just the facts of the matter, people. But uh, Paul will say it says I tried to be all things to all people, but there were those that snuck in and they spied liberally on on the freedom that we have. He wasn't talking about something kinky and foolish. He was talking about we were taking baths and. The, uh, the uh, strict Jews were seeing that not everybody in our company was circumcised and they needed to be circumcised to be one of us. There's nothing perverted or sexual about that. You see, we judge other generations by the zeitgeist of our day so often. You say, what's the zeitgeist of our day? We've, we've talked about this before. There's an attitude or a spirit of our day that we do things for a reason. Our kids and our grandkids are going to look back and say, they were so crazy. Why did they do that? Well, they didn't live in the same day that we're living. That's what, I, I know I'm really putting out a big net here. Don't worry, we're going to rein it in in a second. But, um, that's what's really crazy about a lot of this stuff that's happening now, you know, especially in politics. I, a lot of these people, I don't care for them 
personally myself, but to go back to what someone said in 1972, are you, come on people, or to an attitude that someone had in 1980, come on people, that's, that was a different day. That was a different, now sin is still sin, and I know that's what someone's going to say, sure, sin is still sin. Sin is still sin. God has never changed. But the attitude of the day has, has not uh, necessarily sinned. Okay, so now if I go up to the pub, not the pub, if I go up to the bar, I'm probably going there for a bad reason, and therefore I'm sinning. But in 1895, if I went down to the pub, I probably wasn't going there for the same reason that people are going there. Yeah, there were still people getting drunk there, but the zeitgeist of the day said that that's not a big deal. See, i got to give you a little bit of history lesson so that you can receive the Word of God. Paul says, the love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ calls me into areas and into people and into circumstances that you would judge me over, I guarantee it. But if it's loving people or being judged by you, I'll take the judgment from you because God calls us to love people. I'm walled in. God saved me. God loved me. Now, let's apply this to Paul because surely we wouldn't want to get personal and apply it to ourselves. Let's apply this to Paul zealous what for what he thought was for God legalistic chief among the Pharisees you know capturing the dissenters throwing them in the in the prison or even having them stoned you know Stephen the great uh, the great uh, witness for God Stephen the, the, they stoned him and they threw their cloaks at the feet of Saul at that time his name was Saul and he was nodding his approval on the martyrdom of one of God's great ones Paul says, wait a second, man. I realize what I've been saved from. I realize that Jesus Christ died for the worst sinner upon the, this earth, and he saved me, and he set me free. And because of that, the love of God constrains me to love people, whether they're Jew, whether they're Greek, whether they're Sicthian, whether they're slave, whether they're free. I am constrained by the love of God because of the way that he loved me. I am constrained to love other people. Now, see, we have to be real careful of this because what we do... You know, we, we act as if we're judging people by the word. And what we're doing is we're judging people by the zeitgeist of our circumstance, of our situation. I, uh, I don't care a lot for the commercial, but there's a commercial I've been hearing on the radio. It's a YMCA commercial, and I love the YMCA. They're a great organization. But the commercial says... I, I mean, I'll get it exactly right. The gist of the commercial is, if you grew up one zip code over, you might be a different person. It, have you have heard that? Some of you have heard it. If you grew up one zip code over, you might be a different person. Now, I love the spirit of the commercial, because I, I really think the spirit of the commercial is, hey, you know, remember what you got. You could have a lot less, you know, be thankful for what you have. The spirit of the commercial is great. I, I don't fully agree with the premise of the commercial 100%, but the spirit of the commercial is good. But see, what we do, we judge people by the zeitgeist of, of our culture or our circumstance or our time. And we're, we couldn't be further from the truth in discerning their motives. Now, that was a, just kind of a history lesson. We had to kind of set this all up uh, so that you could understand this with maturity. Okay, so now let's go back to the alcohol illustration, which I have not forgotten, okay? And, uh, and I, don't, uh, I, I don't drink, okay? We, uh, and I don't even want to go down that road of discussing the policy. We'll do that another time uh, to remind people of that. But, but uh, in 18... The end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, water was filthy in Europe. A lot of people were getting sick, but they knew that if you drank alcohol, you didn't get sick. But there was a byproduct of that. A lot of people were becoming drunks, <laughs> you know. But a lot of people, you know, weren't. They were just drinking as there were, was a need to it, medicinal purposes and so forth. But there were a lot of people becoming drunks. And one of God's great servants, uh-oh, watch it now. The love of God constraineth me. One of God's great servants decided, I want to do something about this problem. I want to help this alcohol problem. And so he developed, he began developing a beer formula that would be more filling and less with less alcoholic content. The idea being they could drink more, 
without getting as drunk, and the idea being that they would get full quicker, so it also curbed the desire to drink more, and his name was Guinness. <laughs> Still in business today. Boy, those Irish, they like Guinness. Now, wait, before you judge the guy, remember the whole lesson on the zeitgeist of the day, the spirit of the day? His, his motivation in developing the product was he loved people and he hated the, the destruction and the degradation that was happening in people's lives and in the community and all, and he developed this product. He went on, the company's still around today, I don't know all the buyout details and all that, but they still make it today, Guinness, uh, alcohol. But they said of him that he was... He was the best employee that you could work for. Guinness, without having any government mandate, paid his workers more than twice of what was the average of other people getting paid. He would send the children of his workers. He would pay for their education many times. He would often buy uh, gifts for the spouses of the workers, lavish gifts. He really used his money to improve the community, to improve the culture uh, of his day, and to make a difference in the world. He was a sold-out fervent, passionate uh, servant of God. Now see, it's kind of sad that it took all that build, build up, but you never would have believed that an alcohol producer could have been such a passionate, sold out servant of God until you heard that story. Don't judge him. You didn't walk in a mile in his moccasins. Is drunkenness sin? Absolutely. It's, the Bible says it's sin. It's always been sin. Drunkenness is sin. And he was actually trying to develop a product that would help reduce the, the, the drunkenness as, as he did it. And boy, those Irish, I guess they really like Guinness because it's still going strong today. So uh, don't use your Irish heritage as an excuse, okay? That's, those excuses are not allowed. Okay, what's the point? Love is our purest motiva motivation. Paul said the love of God constrains me. Let me break this down. He's saying, okay... The culture that I grew up in, chief among the Pharisees, you know, very religious, very rigid. He said, if, if I just wanted comfort, I'm, I'm really, really em paraphrasing and embellishing a little bit here. But he said, if I just wanted comfort, I would must, much rather be with the, the feast, the Jewish feast, the festivals. I would much rather have the holy days. I would much rather, you know, have, uh, have uh, the circumcision, the hairstyle. I would much rather, you know, hang out like we used to hang out with the guys, you know, the, the, you know because I, that's the culture I grew up in and I'm comfortable with it. But he's saying, but wait a minute. <laughs> Somebody died for me and purchased my soul from eternal damnation. And on account of that fact, I'm constrained, compelled, I'm walled in by the love of God to love people that are not like me. People that don't hold the same attitude as me. People that don't hold the same background as me. I'm walled in. I'm hedged in. The love of God constrains me and it compels me to love people. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Vincent Word Study says that it means to be shut up into one line of purpose, as in a narrow way. The great German theologian DeWitt says that this verse means that the love which Christ has displayed has also been imparted. In other words, God showed us this very love. He showed us what it was to be constrained by the love of God, and He imparted that into our life through the Holy Spirit. You see... Think about Jesus. We know that he would have much rather not gone through the cross. Because he said that in the garden the night before his crucifixion. He said three times, Father, take this cup away from me. But not my will, Father. Not my will. Your will be done. You see, his love for the Father, number one, and his love for us, number two, constrained him in such a way that he was saying, God, I'm going to walk this lonely road. I'm going to go through the sacrifice. I'm going to love these people. Even Judas, who betrays me with a kiss. I'm going to love him. I'm constrained by the love of God. It says in, in the word, it says that he loved them to the very end. Even Peter, who denied him three times when he needed him, and then was so inferior, and it took that visitation from Jesus, and then that infilling of the Holy Spirit for him to overcome that. But Jesus says, I'm going to go through this because the love of God constrains 
constrains me to do it. There probably wasn't a person alive when Jesus went to the cross that fully understood why he was doing it until afterwards. Until after he rose from the dead. But Jesus was constrained to his purpose. He was walled in. He was propelled, compelled, and pushed forward because of the love of God. And because of his love for us. You see, love is the purest of all motivations. When we are motivated by love, things may look like they're getting messy. But when we're motivated by love, that's when God will bless us. That's when God will make even crazy things work. God will even make a brewery work when the founder is motivated by love. Now, you can work that out in your theology all day long if you want. I'm just reporting the news. Love also is our most powerful manifestation. Not only the purest motivation, it's the most powerful manifestation. The greatness of our love towards God is manifested as we keep His commandments. Now, Sunday school was about that, so... Uh, Pastor Mary taught on that, so I'm not going to say very, stay very long on that. But I just want to look at John 14, 15 through 16 to just pick up one aspect of that. And then I'll say no more after that because Sunday school for those that were there was a lesson on this. John 14, 15 through 16. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's pretty cut and dry in it. Isn't it? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So, what I love about this, what a wonderful promise, that we so often miss a little bit of this. What a wonderful promise. See, so often, the Word says that you're to keep his commandments. And you broke one. And I'm waiting to catch you. You don't wait to catch me because I probably, not intentionally, but I probably unintentionally broke something this morning. All right? Not by design. But things happen. Okay, you don't have to wait to catch me. I'm already caught. I'm guilty. Apart from the blood of Jesus. Amen. Apart from the blood of Jesus. You know, all my hope is in the blood of Jesus. You know, that don't mean that we're practicing evil. But we are human. Everyone in this place is human. We can be real about that. But what I love about this is Jesus doesn't just say, keep my commandments. He says, I'm giving you a helper. Now, that, that's that powerful word paraclete that he uses to describe Holy Spirit. Just like uh, I've said it many times, but as a parasite would attach and suck life out of you, the paraclete attaches himself to you and pumps life into you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us uh, not only grace and forgiveness when we do mess up, but he gives us the ability uh, to do what is right. Okay, so... I'm going to come down here and I'm going to use Philip. Actually, Philip, come here, man. You're a, good, you're a good man. Because you've had so much to say this morning, we're going to use you as an illustration. Am I being bad? No, you're not. Okay. So, Philip, if I say, uh, Philip, pick that bottle up. Well, you're being good. Okay, so go ahead and put it back. Philip, pick that bottle up. Go ahead and put it back. Philip, pick that bottle up. Put it back. Pick it up. Put it back. <laughs> now, how long is this going to work till it wears out? <laughs> Philip's a nice guy, but eventually he's going to get tired of this. Okay? Um, he's being very, because he's in church. If we were probably out there on the roof, he would have probably said something mean to me already. But, <laughs> but uh, because we're in church, he's being nice about this. Okay? And, which is good. Good. But, uh... I'm telling him what to do, and he's submitting to doing it, but it's completely of his own volition, okay? Now, this is not exactly, no, no, not yet. <laughs> this is not exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, which would be enough because he's God. He says, do something, we should just do it because he's God. But at times, our own volition wears out. Our own willpower wears out. You got to be honest, you knew you weren't supposed to eat that second cupcake. 
but your willpower wore out and you did it anyway and you knew it wasn't right to eat it. But here's what's wonderful about this. The word says, Jesus himself says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then he also says, I'm sending my Holy Spirit into your life as a helper. So now it's not just my word, it's my interaction with Philip. Philip picked that up and you resist me a little bit. Philip's resisting me a little bit and he still has free will, but if I'm telling him to pick that up, he's going to feel the resistance of my presence. You know, the resistance of my presence. And, you know, being the good-hearted man that he is, eventually he's going to cave into that. The love of God. You know, again, the love of God constrains us. Thank you. Good man. You're a good man. But uh, the difference being that God doesn't just say to do something, but God gives us the Holy Spirit that leads us, that guides us, that literally, uh, some verses literally can be translated that he takes our hand. Some places it can be translated that he arrests us. There's a witness of the Holy Spirit within us. So it's not as if we got to walk around with our list of the Ten Commandments or the 685 whatever commandments, you know, of Ithaca Open Bible. Just kidding. Not really. We're, we're not that way. But it's not like we got to walk around with our little pen and check off the commandments. No, that's not it. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's given us. And, you know, we are doing our best to live for God and to love for God. But in those moments where we start to stray, the interaction of the Holy Spirit is always tugging on us, always taking our hand, always pulling us back, and always saying, you may have free will, but I'm not going to make it easy for you. That's the interaction of the Holy Spirit. Um, actually, we could illustrate this another way. The Bible says that Jesus... If there are, are 99 sheep in the fold and one wanders away, what does he say? Leave him and say, you idiot, you got what you always deserved. You knew that was coming. Didn't you know better? <laughs> you know, I told you not to go near that cliff, you dumb sheep. No, what did Jesus do? He left the 99 and he went after the one. He's the one that never leaves the one behind. Amen. Because you see... He doesn't just say, keep my commandments. He then personally interacts with us in the process. Uh, here, restraining us. Here, compelling us. Here, reminding us. And as we, as we respond to His love, that's how we display our love for Him. As we listen to Him, as we respond, we display that we love God. So love is manifested towards God as we keep His commandments. Now, I won't say much on this because it's kind of common sense, but love is manifested towards other people when we simply help them. I've already shared illustrations on this. We often feel like we don't have enough to give. But yet, if we just help them, that's showing love. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. God showed His love towards us. The Word says that God demonstrated His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, we're heading for one of our closes here, okay? But I, I learned about a wonderful story this week that I'm going to get the audio book. And it, it, it's called The Leaf by... Nigel, The Leaf by Nigel, I think is it, and it's one of, it's a J.R.R. Tolkien book, one of his lesser known works, uh, you know, he wrote Lord of the Rings and all that, and uh, in this book, I'm so excited, I want to get it, because I just read the synopsis of it, I haven't read the actual book yet, and there's this man, his name's Nigel, I hope I'm saying the right name, and he becomes fascinated with leaves, like leaves on trees. He's an artist. And so in his little studio, he begins to paint a leaf. And you know how some artists, they get fascinated over an apple and they'll draw it for years. Well, Nigel is fascinated over this leaf and he begins to paint this leaf. Well, you know what happens in life. The project always gets bigger than you're expecting. So it becomes multiple leaves. It becomes a tree. It becomes this big monumental project that he never has a chance of finishing in his life. But he just loves leaves and he just wants to capture the imagery of a leaf. So as Nigel's working, he has one problem. He's just such a nice guy. And so the neighbor guy's disabled. And so oftentimes Nigel has to stop work
work on his painting and he has to go help the neighbor guy and he grumbles. He's glad to do it, but he grumbles about it because he could be working on the leaf, you know, and his, his, his life's work. And, you know, he goes, it goes through the process of helping people and doing things for the community and so forth. And these things just keep getting in the way of what he really knows he's called to do is to paint a perfect leaf and a perfect tree. Well, eventually Nigel dies and the analogy is that he gets on the train and he's headed towards heaven on the train. Just pause there for just a minute. Back on earth where Nigel was working on his big artistic work, he was very little known. Nobody really knew Nigel. So what they did was they decided in the community, we'll take one of his leaves, we'll frame it, we'll put it in the public museum. You know, because he was a local artist, we'll honor him that way. But unfortunately, a couple years later, the local museum burns down. So on earth, all knowledge of Nigel's wiped out. All of his work is done. He really wanted to complete this tree, but he wasted so much time helping other people that all of his work is wiped away. Now here's where the story picks up. He's on the train, and he's headed into the promised land. And as the train is going into the promised land and he's headed towards heaven, he looks out the window and there's this tree. Not just the painting of his tree, but there's this tree alive, vibrant, green, in more dimensions than ever could have been captured on earth. He jumps off the, tree, off the train, he looks at the tree, and he realizes, this is what I always envisioned, and I could never, I could never quite grasp it. There, that's, that leaf is exactly like I wanted it in the beginning, and there are these other leaves that I was working on and didn't get to. Those are the leaves I had envisioned, and I never could. There's even buds. I I know I would have thought of that if I would have had a few more years. I would have done that. And the moral of the story is that Nigel felt like he didn't accomplish his life's work because he kept getting distracted with other people. But in heaven, God brought a deeper and a fuller fulfillment to all of that stuff than he ever could have achieved on earth. You see, God has called us to love. And so often, I know that I'm guilty of this. I struggle with this. So often the side things that take us off track here and there that get in the way, so often we come to realize those are the very things that God wanted us to do in the first place. Most of Jesus' greatest miracles were performed while he was going some other place. That's a fact. 90% of Jesus' miracles that we have recorded in Scripture were performed while he was headed some other place. And a lady came and worked her faith. And a man came and worked his faith. And, and a blind man at the side of the road cried out. And a Syrophoenician woman who wasn't even a Jew said, I know you can deliver my daughter. And a woman with an issue of blood tugged on him when he was walking through the crowd somewhere else. The greatest work that we do is to love people. And oftentimes, to love people looks like we're getting off track. But God knows our heart. God knows our motivation. The greatness of love is manifested towards others when we simply help them. And in closing, for real, the greatness of love can even be manifested towards our enemies. This is what is distinct about Christian love. Now, it's great to say amen to this on a Sunday morning, but we all know how hard this is, right? When you're working next to the person on the line, right? Whatever your job is, you know, or, you're, or, you, know, or, you, or you got the bag boy that just tries to break the eggs, right? When you're checking out, whatever the illustration is. You know, we know how it is, right? When you got the one that just wants the argument, they just want to pick, they just want to argue, they just want to what. It's easy to talk about it, but I'm telling you, the greatest distinctive of Christian love is that God's love through us is manifested towards our enemies. Let's read what Jesus said as we close. Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 48. But I, Jesus, say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do this? But if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than any other? 
Do not even the tax collectors do this also? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus says perfect love is the ability to love people who hate you. The ability to love people who persecute you. The ability to love people that don't understand why you do it or why you did it. The ability to love people that are just out to get you. It's the hardest thing, isn't it? But that is really the pinnacle of our Christian experience on this earth.